Hi, I'm Justin Worland, and I'm joined here today by Time 100 2020 honoree Sister Norma Pimentel, as well as Secretary Julian Castro, who served in the Obama administration uh, before his 2020 run for president. Secretary Castro wrote about the humanitarian work that Sister Norma has done at the US-Mexico border. Welcome to Time 100 Talks. Sister Norma, I, I want to start with you and just ask you, what does this recognition being on uh, the Time 100 mean to you? You know, uh, sometimes I have a hard time without being recognized myself because it represents a lot of pain So for so many families that I've encountered. And, and I've seen their suffering up front very closely. And so, but it, I think it represents for me an opportunity to, to bring forward these innocent victims of families that I've seen on so many, for so many uh, years and recognize the fact that there are people and this recognition can showcase the fact that we must pay attention to them, you know. Well, Secretary Castro, I just want to ask, why was it important for you to, to, to take the time to write uh, about Sister Norma? Well, I think she's fantastic. You know, I've been amazed by Sister Norma's work and the compassion, uh, the commitment that she has brought, not only in the last few years, uh, when we've had uh, a federal government that has used cruelty um, as uh, as a means of of I think um, you know dealing with migrants, but also through the years, um, she has been devoted to um, treating every single human being that she comes in contact with, people who are seeking a better life on this side of the border, with compassion and easing their uh, pain and suffering just a little bit more. Uh, and she's done that in a very selfless way with the help of a lot of people. Uh, and she's modest, but with the help of a lot of people, but also with tremendous leadership. And I think that's very deserving of recognition, especially in these times. Sister Norma, you've been working on these issues for decades. What have been the implications of COVID-19, both for migrants and for your work on the border? You know, it has made it more difficult for the families. It might, it's harder for me to see the families suffering more because, because of COVID, uh, the families are not able to continue that uh, uh, immigration process. It's all on stops. And because of COVID, the Mexican government does not allow them to enter the camp anymore. Any new refugees are, are left outside. And so COVID has brought in a uh, harsher uh, response for the care that we must have for the families, you know, and so thank God that COVID has not entered the camp, you know, the families are, you don't see them sick, they carry on, and we don't see them uh, at all with any symptoms of being uh, affected by the virus, so that is a blessing. Thinking both about, about COVID, but also this political moment, uh, how challenging is it for, for migrants, um, particularly when you reflect on the course of your time working on this? You know, it's unfortunate that the whole immigration reality, the fact that people, human beings, are coming to north to the United States simply for the reason that they're afraid of for their lives, especially of their children. And because of all the political scheme that is going on, it's being, they're being used as a way to showcase their political uh, agenda or whatever it is that they want, rather than focusing on the actual need of the immigration reality, the crisis that we're seeing, the humanitarian suffering of people, that is totally disregarded. And it's unfortunate that they're victims of that. Yeah. Well, well Secretary Castro, immigration reform was a key part of your uh, campaign last year when you ran for president. And I'm just curious whether you could uh, speak to some of the uh, key components that are part of what you call the, a, a quote, humane um, border policy. Yeah, I mean, I believe that we need to uh, replace the cruelty that we've seen over these last few years with compassion and with common sense. Uh, and there's so many changes that need to be made, but one of the ones that Sister Norma uh, is, is grappling with in her work on a daily basis and that she's referring to these migrant camps stems from 
this administration's Migrant Protection Protocols, MPP, or Remain in Mexico policy. It used to be, uh, for so many years, the policy of the United States to allow people who were seeking asylum, for instance, in our country to do so here in the United States. Instead, thousands of uh, potential asylees have been left to fend for themselves in Mexico and be more subject to violence, uh, potentially to disease, uh, to, to uh, uh, a harder life because of that. Immediately, the next administration, I believe, you know, if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are elected, they're going to have an opportunity to reverse these executive decisions that Donald Trump has made, including the Remain in Mexico policy. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, I believe that we need to, to do that. And we also need to uh, ensure that we put the 11 million undocumented immigrants who are here on a pathway to citizenship. We need to close these private uh, detention centers and instead come up with a, a, a pragmatic, workable way to get people uh, to family members who are here already or to establish a home for unaccompanied minor as, minors as quickly as possible instead of what we've seen over the last few years. Well, I, I'm curious to hear from both of you about this question, but obviously the, the U.S. is a country of immigrants, um, uh, and somehow the, the narrative, at least certainly from the president, has turned immigrants, uh, migrants into you know criminals. That's been the narrative from some folks. How, how does that narrative change? You know, what can be done to change that narrative? And I'll, I'll start with you, Secretary Castro, and then I'd love to hear from Sister Norma as well. Well, I mean, look, uh, you know, and Sister Norma knows this better than I do. I mean, let's be honest, uh, there's a long history that predates this president of immigrants being scapegoated, um, and then specifically immigrants from Latin America being painted as uh, you know, dangerous and criminals. And Donald Trump took that to another level. The next president and the next Congress and all of us in our daily lives have an opportunity to help change that narrative by, t by telling the stories of, uh, of migrants who are simply seeking a better life, letting people know, educating the American public about the reality. I mean, you know, the vast, vast majority of these folks are like everybody else. I mean, they simply want better for their children. They want to be able to, to be free from violence, uh, from, from other threats. They see America like generations of, of the past have as a beacon of opportunity, and they want to be a part of that. Uh, so we can change our immigration laws, and I believe we're going to have a chance to do that in 2021. I believe we're going to change presidents, which is important. Um, we can take uh, you know, our own responsibility in helping to change that narrative. Media have an important responsibility to tell their stories accurately and to help change, you know, to tell the truth. Um, uh, and uh, I think that um, we also need to raise a generation of young people in the years to come that has an appreciation for the contributions that people of different lands who have come to the United States have made so that these bad negative narratives don't take hold the way that they have in years past. Right. Sister Norma, do you? Yes, that would be wonderful. I think that the, the narrative, uh, unfortunately, that we hear, you know, I, I've run into, for example, a, a lady at the supermarket and she tells me, uh, hermana, tengo miedo. And, and I said, she's afraid. And I said, why? What is it that you're afraid of? Of all those people that you are um, helping? And I say, why? Why are you afraid of them? Because of all the things that you hear uh, in the in the media and that they are criminals, they're not. You know, I spent all day with them, and they're beautiful people. They're mothers and fathers. They care for their children. They cry for them. They wish the best. They come and and bring to us uh, something good, you know. Yes, there may be one person that may be bad, but that doesn't make them all bad, you know, just like there are bad people here too as well. We have to recognize the, the, the diversity and how that diversity brings good, something good as 
know, we all do, you know. And so I think that uh, learning to be open and welcoming allows us to be able to see the other person for who they are and respect them for, for the person that they are, you know. And so I think that we definitely have to break away from that fear that, that has been placed on us to be afraid for something that we don't know. And, then, and I always invite, Ben, come and see. If you can see what I see, I am certain you will feel how I feel about these families and these children. Well, it's a, I wanted to ask, you invited President Trump to come uh, when he was in Texas uh, to see your center and to see your work, and he didn't show I, up. But I um, certainly hope that he could have, you know, yeah. because uh, I think as a, uh, the, the position that he holds is very important, and he must be able to come close to see the people so that the things that he does and he makes the decisions as important as they are can be based on what he have experienced and what he, and then from there make a decision for the good of all, you know? Um, well, Secretary Castro, I want to ask about, um, about your immigration plan. Again, you referenced um, climate change and, and some of the effects of climate change for people um, uh, that have driven people uh, to, the, to the U.S. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about, about that. What, what role has climate played um, in, in driving immigration? Well, I mean, it's playing a greater and greater role uh, in the movement of people, the need for people to move across borders. And, you know, one estimate I saw said over the next few decades that up to 200 million people could be considered climate refugees. Uh, for, for those who think, well, look, you know, what are you talking about? Just think about what we're watching right now on the West Coast, in California, in Oregon, and how that has caused the movement of many people. And those are, those are fairly, you know, some of them are densely populated, like the San Francisco Bay Area. They're also sparsely populated areas. But people having to move because of this, and, you know, we know that these kinds of events are getting more frequent because of climate change. Well, that's mm -hmm. happening around the world. So I propose in my plan that the United States create a specific category for climate refugees. Uh, number one, we need to take in more refugees in general because uh, particularly under this Trump administration, they have uh, whittled that down and whittled that down. I don't think America is doing what it can by far. It needs to do more with refu refugees generally. But we also need to be responsive to the reality of climate refugees. And then most importantly, as you know, we actually need to address climate change in a robust uh, and effective way in this country. Uh, and in so many ways, we're going to have the opportunity to do that, I think, beginning in early 2021. S Sister Norma, I just wanted to ask whether, um, you know, in your conversations with with people who you interact and work with, whether that's something they talk about, because of course violence drives people from cities, but drought. Uh... Yes, yes, I totally agree. Uh, many of the families have shared with us the reasons why they come. And one of them is precisely that, that they're farmers, they're, they're people that work out in the country and their land is dry. They can't really grow anything anymore. And, and they, they even people from the furthest end of Mexico, like, Oaxaca and all those areas, Chiapas, they, they're coming north because really they're not able to grow anything anymore, you know, and a lot of it has to, evidently has to be because of the climate change, you know. One thing that I feel like conversation about immigration is often about the border and, you know, immigration uh, enforcement policies, but what should be done to support um, people before they feel the need to be driven from their homes? I mean, is there, are there things that the U.S. should be doing? Um, and I leave that question to, to both of you. I'll start with you, Sister Norma. Yes, well, I, obviously, if people would be rather stay home, I think they would, they lose everything. They uproot themselves from their culture, their families, their everything. And so if they have a choice. Uh, I visited a family in the Bay Area in California, and they, they really were hurting that they couldn't go back home, you know. But if we could, the United States, the governments need to help each other to 
stabilize those countries. You know, the biggest problem is organized crime. Why don't we focus on those guys, you know? Get rid of them, you know, dismantle all this because that's the serious problem. If you can work at, at addressing that really problem, you would, you would fix everything, I think, as far as why people have to migrate. They're not safe, you know? They can't work. They cannot leave there. They, they are, their lives are in danger. This is very serious. And so working at stabilizing and contributing to any efforts done in those countries to help families stay home, I think that's where our efforts need to be, you know? Right. Secretary Castro, did you hear yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I mean, for many, many years, the United States has not given uh, enough time, attention, and I think effort to cultivating positive, strong relationships with these Latin American countries, whether we're talking about the Northern Triangle countries or other countries, including these days, Mexico. Uh, and one of the things I called for was essentially a Marshall Plan for Latin America with a focus on these Northern Triangle countries so that we could engage at a level of mutual respect uh, to try and create uh, the opportunity for people, if they're in Honduras or El Salvador or Guatemala, to be able to have better uh, job opportunities, to be safer, so that as Sister Norma says, that they can stay in their home. Nobody likes to, you know, be, Folks are moving because they need to, because they're running from something and running toward what they believe is a better life. If we can get at the root of that, um, of that challenge, then I think that's going to be a victory for everybody, folks who would love to stay in their, in their uh, home country and prosper there, uh, the United States and the relationship with those countries, uh, and with the politics here in the United States that gets so charged up over these issues. Totally agree. Well, I want to ask you both. I mean, this COVID, uh, this year and with COVID and uh, so much um, happening has created an opportunity for rejuvenation, for rethinking a lot of different things. And I'm just curious to both of you, what are your hopes for a post COVID world, uh, particularly along the issues that we're talking about, but also more broadly? Well, definitely, uh, we need to move forward to a world where we are more connected, united with each other, you know, that we can work together to focus on the things that we have the same so that, that we can move away from all this hatred and everything that has uh, kind of like put a hold on us, on, on the world overall. I think that our country needs, and our country needs to work with other countries to be a, countries that that work together and that uh, focus on the goodness of life, you know? Uh, I don't understand why we can't do that as, a, as people that all want that, you know, we all want that. Why couldn't we just focus on, on developing that, you know, and, and focus on the goodness and, that we have to offer each other, you know, and make a world a better world, you know? And we're all hurting. COVID has taught us that there's no boundaries, you know, it, we're all the same we are affected exactly we're all vulnerable and fragile it shows us how united we must be to be able to be a better community a better world it's great uh, secretary Jasper. i i sure do hope that it that, that this experience that we're going through uh as a country as a world really um you know that it enhances community going forward i also hope that because I think this has been a real reckoning. The deeper that we get into it, it really is a reckoning with, with all of the dynamics that have created the kind of inequality that exists in our country. And that, as many people have said, the most vulnerable people have been hit the hardest, and they've also been the ones that have been asked to step up the most. And this is where our conversation, I think, intersects with vulnerable communities. Think about farm workers, for instance, that are, or meatpacking plant workers that are still out there in their same, you know, bad conditions with relatively meager pay, meager benefits, as it has been for years, but doing their hard work in the hot sun so that everybody has food on the table, even during this pandemic, risking their own health. Same thing with meatpacking plant workers and others. Well, the question is, 
what are we going to do for all of them and many others like them who are vulnerable, who don't have health care, who don't have enough to put food on their own table or to pay the rent and are threatened with eviction right now and will be because we had a rental affordability crisis even before COVID-19 hit us. I hope that coming out of this, we're going to have more of a commitment, more of an understanding that we are a community, that we need each other, and more of a commitment to make the investments to see healthcare as a human right, to see housing as a human right, to try and ensure that we eliminate hunger in this country. And those all sound like big things, and they are big things, right? But they're not Pollyannish things. We can get closer and closer and closer to each and every one of them. I think if we have the political will to do it. Well, that's that's a, a great note uh, to end on. Thank you so much, Sister Norma and uh, Secretary Castro, for taking the time to be here. It's great to have you on.